be seated. The passages of the New Testament today give us a simple reminder of who we are. As we look there in the book of Acts and in the book of John, probably one of the most uh, familiar chapters of the entire Bible, not just in the church, but even in realms outside the church. There's a lot of people that can quote John 3.16 who neither believe it nor care for it or anything else. But it's just so uh, popular and commonly spoken that it's uh, you know become very familiar to many people. But in these two passages, I believe that we get a picture of who we are because embedded in these two passages is the three streams of conversions of which the charismatic Episcopal Church is a participant. Very strongly we see in there the element of evangelicalism. Uh, when Nicodemus first came to Jesus, he said, Lord, we know you're a teacher. That's evangelical. Teaching the Word of God. Even the angel, when the angel set the apostles free, what did he tell them? Go and teach the good news of this life. And it said there that the apostles went into the temple and began to teach. Later on, as we'll see tomorrow, when they were called in front of the Sanhedrin, their charge was, you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. That's again, evangelical, the sharing of the Word of God. And so we see that here in the early church and even in the early ministry of Jesus, the important role that teaching had to play there. We also see the charismatic element, because we saw in the beginning of the gospel, or excuse me, the beginning of the Acts reading, how many miracles were being done. We usually consider miracles to be a realm of the charismatic, because one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is healing. And so when the apostles were going along the streets and healing people, and others were, you know, uh, just holding the following the apostles around and hoping to get healed and having spirits cast out. And, you know, how charismatic is that when you're casting spirits out of people? Very charismatic. And when, you know, they saw that was happening, uh, this was the, the Lord moving in the church through the charismatic stream. And so we see that also. We also see the sacramental stream. When Jesus said, anyone before they can enter the kingdom of God must be born again of water and the Spirit. Does this not speak of baptism? which is a sacrament. And also when Jesus said, if I, the Son of Man, be lifted up, He will draw all men to Himself. He's talking about the Eucharist. Every Eucharist, the priest, the celebrant, lifts up the Son of Man in the form of the bread. And so again we see the third stream, the sacrament, uh, or the, uh, the stream of the sacramental. And so it's uh, good to remember that, you know, who, who God has called us to be, in the CDC, in the Charismatic Episcopal Church, and in the Convergence Movement, it's not just something odd. It's not something out in left field somewhere. It's not something, you know, this somebody just sort of came up with that people were, oh, it's kind of cultish or something. It's embedded right in the Word of God, right in everybody's favorite chapter of the Bible, John 3, right in one of the other more popular chapters of the Bible, uh, Acts chapter 5 when we hear about the, the apostles being miraculously released from prison and the miracles they were doing and all of that. It's also important to remember that these things weren't always very well accepted. After all, when the apostles were practicing these three streams, we don't see the sacramental stream pretty much in chapter 5, but we've seen earlier they were participating in the breaking of the bread and fellowship and the prayers, and that is certainly the Eucharist. Uh, wasn't always very well received. After all, in the reading, the Sanhedrin threw them in prison. Obviously, they weren't on their top ten list. Even Nicodemus, he didn't, he didn't get it. He didn't understand it. He said, Jesus, we see you're a teacher. Jesus, we appreciate all the signs you're doing. But he didn't have a clue about the sacramental side. And when Jesus tried to share with him about the sacramental side, he was like, uh, uh, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. And that's what it is when you're forerunners. Because here in the Cathedral of the King, we've been kind of forerunners of the Convergence Movement for probably um, 25 years or more, almost 25 years. And 
forerunners aren't always accepted really well. Eventually, you know, there'll be more and more people that understand convergence and receive convergence. I, I believe that somewhere in the future, it'll be the normal thing to be convergence. If you're something other than convergence, if you only have one or two streams, you'll be considered the oddball. And you know, perhaps even that will fade away eventually. I'm not talking about how many years that will be. It could be many. But the point is, being the forerunner is not always easy. You get misunderstood, like Jesus was with Nicodemus. You get persecuted, like the apostles were with the Sanhedrin and those in charge of the Jewish religious system of that time. But truth is truth. And truth stands, and truth remains. Like the psalm shared that with us very powerfully, Psalm 89. Uh, you know, righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne, and it is truth. It stands forever. And so, let's be just reminded of these things this morning, of who we are, and what our future is. Our future is not to go spiraling downward into a blazing crash of, of infamy. You know, our future is good. And our future is one day we won't be so misunderstood. One day we won't be so, you know, talked about and, and disparaged and things like that. Uh, don't worry, because one day the world will understand that God has formed the church in three streams. And everybody will know that one day. So don't be discouraged when you aren't understood by people. Don't be discouraged when you're even persecuted by people. Happened to the apostles, happened to Jesus. And they turned out all right. right? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand.